All right, we are on day 18. There's like a week left, right? One, seven, seven of them left, something like that. All right, thanks to your efforts, the parts factory is one of the first factories up and running since the lava fall came back. There's a backlog. Factory will also need a large supply of lava for a while. They've already started creating a large lagoon for the purpose. However, they aren't sure the lagoon will be big enough. Look at the dig plan. This is the dig plan. Those look like colors. The digger starts in a one meter cube hole in the ground. They dig the specified numbers up, down, left, or right, clearing the full one meter cubes as they go. Voxels? Anyway, directions are seen from above, so up or north and right would be east and so on. Okay. Each trench is also listed with the color that the edge of the trench should be painted as an RGB hex color. They are hex codes. When viewed from above, the above dig plan would result in the following loop of trench having been dug out from the otherwise ground level terrain. At this point, the trench could contain 38 cubic meters of lava. However, this is just the edge of the lagoon. The next step is to dig out the interior so that it is one meter deep as well. Yada, yada, yada. Dig out the interior. The edges are also painted according to the color codes. Okay. That seems like it's a part two thing. The elves are concerned the lagoon won't be large enough. If they follow their dig plan, how many cubic meters of lava could it hold? Okay, so let's just start by taking this and executing the dig plan and then digging out the interior. I think that the interior is going to be the same algorithm we used the other day, uh, which is probably point and polygon, right? So to find all these interiors, these interiors seem very straightforward compared to the interiors that we had in the other one. But you could imagine like a situation in which that is not true. So just create day teen, clear that out. We've got so many directories now, so many directories. Here's our part one. I really want to parse these into actual colors, uh, but I don't think I'm going to. <laughs> not at least not until part two. Maybe we'll visualize today. That would be fun. Hopefully we can get done fast enough to do something like that. OK, so we have direction, how far it needs to go and the color, right? This is just like a random grid, too, right? So we aren't even given a grid to dig out. This is just like a random start somewhere and then do it. OK, so this is going to be drawing a line, I guess, effectively. Let's do, um, what is this called? A dig, dig plan. I'm going to call this dig instruction. I think string slices today because we don't need to return any extra information about where they are in the input. And we're just going to get back dig instructions. Dig instructions then are going to be what? A direction, probably as an IVAC2, right? A count as we'll call it a U size, maybe? I32. I32 sounds better because... The direction is going to be I-32s, and then we won't have to convert them. This, why did I name this an enum? Um, dig instruction is going to be direction, count, color. And I think color we're just going to leave as a string slice for now. This is a struct. We're going to derive debug on this. So we have a dig instruction. Uh, do we need to add glam here? We do. Glam true. These come from glam. Let Rust Analyzer catch up for a second. OK, so we need a dig instruction. We've got right, down, left, and up, right? So let's say we have one of those four each. So let's do an alt, and I'm going to do, I guess, a car, and I'll do a car for each of them, and I'm going to map, and it's not going to matter what we parse out of this. We're going to get IVEC2, and there should be a Y. In this case, it's going to be X, because we're going to the right. IVEC, if I can spell, IVEC2, and then we have neg X, or not neg1, but neg X. So we've got going to the east, going to the west, same thing the other way. And we'll call north, guess what, up and down, U and D. And up today is going to be Y and down is going to be negative Y because we're going to have a 2D grid and we're not going to know where we're going to be. So I want to use, uh, instead of the normal grid that we use, I want to use Y up and that'll be direction. We're going to pass input, handle the error. Uh, these need to be complete car. I Okay, <laughs> now that the sirens are all gone. Uh, this is going to be a direction, which is an IVEC2, and each of these is going to be a 1 in the appropriate direction. So X is going to be 1, 0, neg X is going to be negative 1, 0, and we just have all the directions we need to go in. This will make it easier for us to deal with later. Then we're going to call this count, I guess, and this is going to be delimited, space 1, complete I32, I guess, space 1, handle the error, import what we need, bring what we need into scope. Okay, so we've got the count there as an I32, and then we need to parse the hex out. So this is going to be also delimited, and I'm going to do complete car paren. What is it? That hex digit, complete car paren, and then input and handle the error. Now, this is particularly interesting because the 
definitive like intro example for how to parse a thing in nom is actually a hex code which is really fun and interesting i don't know whether to handle the hash right now or not if i'm being honest because i don't know what we're going to do with it later so for now i'm going to take the easy way out because you never know what we're going to have to do and we'll use tag which is not incomplete what is wrong with tag there oh i've got the nom supreme tag i don't want the nom supreme tag right now so we have a direction we have a count let me add a little bit of white space in here direction count and the hex string slice we'll use rust analyzer to fill struct fields on the dig instruction which will all just magically go in and then we get all of our dig instructions so we write a quick parser separated list one line ending dig instruction input should work out bring separated list one in bring line ending in and then we have instructions so i'm gonna call them digs input should parse debug digs to do the rest make sure our input variable is around and then we test day 18 part one which will fail but will give us the direction that we're headed in the count that we have to do it and the color so now we have this over all of the instructions which is really great so if we need to go six in this direction we do six times this and we're done so what do we do with that information obviously we take that and we execute each one of them so digs.iter and this is going to be a flat map because we're going to create a bunch of different positions this is going to be an instruction right it's a reference to an instruction and we are going to zero dot dot instruction dot count right i think we want this to be one though well not necessarily if we're gonna we're gonna end up adding these so so if we get zero to instruction count i guess we have to fold this at some point i think i do want to expand this into all of the instructions so i think instruction repeat instruction dot count something like this is going to work i think we have to call repeat in a different way yeah obviously no repeat found on that so was it standard iter repeat instruction instruction dot count we'll just pass the whole thing in for now i'm blanking on standard iter repeat right now standard iter repeat takes a thing to just repeat forever okay <laughs> maybe i mean that is what we want but that just means we need to take instruction dot count of them well that is both missing the e and the i and then this is going to be like it needs to be a u size so as u size so if we iter over this for every instruction then we get the next move that we need to make for all of them and then i think scan is going to be useful here it's probably going to be a little bit more than we want but it's going to be useful so scan takes a starting state and a state and every iteration we do something and we return that until we return none so in this case we're starting with one and if we take this over to rust playground and we run it we get nothing because it's all asserts so let's throw some debugs in here so that we can show what this does. I think state X is probably the most useful. So state is one, X is one. State is one, X is two. State is two, X is three. State is six, X is four. So we're getting in that value every single time, right? The value from A, this iter. So one, two, three, four. That's our X, one, two, three, four. And in this case, each iteration, they multiply the state by the element. So X times one, and we either stop or we return the negative. So X times one is negative one state is still one two times one is two that would be negative two three times two is six this is a really confusing example to use honestly so i wanted to do this as a little bit of a shortcut honestly because we could do ivec2 new zero zero and then state is zero zero here and next and then we could do state plus equals next some state right does that not work that should work I think those are both, those both should be IVEC twos at this point. Oh, a dig instruction is what we get, right? So this is gonna be next dot direction. So, but if we do all of that and we collect it, I think we're missing zero, zero. So if we say that's travel, we collect everything and we debug travel, even for our test input, this is gonna be pretty big. So I think we're gonna actually wanna do something a little bit different. What is our input for this? Write six. I guess it always makes it back to zero, zero, right? It has to close the loop. So maybe that won't be an issue for us because of the way that this function works, right? We'll go from one, zero, two, zero, three, zero, four, zero, five, zero, six, zero. And then we go down five, six, negative one, six, negative two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think because of the way this works, we always return to zero, zero as the last step. So I think we'll be fine because this always has to loop. I feel like that's not technically true, but as long as we always get back to the first step, then we're good. So we've got all of the positions, right? And we could use our print grid now, make sure that we've drawn the right path. Print grid is a function we've been using over the last couple of days. And I suppose when it comes down to it, that could also be a hash set that we collect into and we'll save a little bit of memory there. We don't really need to though. So let's grab this print grid, which is what we've had before. I guess we do have a hash set here. Let's just change this to a 
not a vec. Like, okay, so we can change this to a vec, right? Let's let's go over this for a second. And then we could do contains this. And that's either going to be true or false, right? And we either print a hash or we print a dot. Now we need to create the boundaries. So we need to do a little iteration here for the sort of lowest number and the highest number. But another thing we could do here is instead of taking a shared reference to a vec, we can just take a slice and that will work for us as well. Same thing. We just open up our API a little bit to take more things because if you can turn it into a slice, that is not just vex. So there is a selection of min and max functions in the Rust standard library. And we could use each of those to get the boundaries, but iter tools has a min max, which will give us both of them. So we'll get X and Y, and this will always be true for us, these conditions, because that's the way advent of code works. And technically this function is more efficient as documented in the docs than calling min and then calling max. So we need travel.iter.map because remember we get ivec2s here, but what we want is the x's for one min max x and then min max y here uh, it looks like there's an issue with min max for some reason what is that method not found in map iter because we didn't bring iter tools in yep because we didn't bring iter tools in uh travel is used in this debug so we'll get rid of that this was going to be an ownership issue a remove issue more likely and i'm going to do let min max x min x max equals this else panic should have a min and a max for x. And this needs to be, what is the actual enum? Min max result. So we'll bring in min max result and do this. And we'll do the same thing for y's, y min, y max. And this is also going to be let else. Let else is really fun syntax for this. Should have a min and a max for y. And I think this is the case for both of these. So we should be fine. And then we're going to print grid with travel and our boundaries. I guess we need our boundaries to be slightly different uh, looking at it, right? Because if we do negative four dot dot four, right, dot into it or whatever, it doesn't matter. Or actually, let's just do a for loop. For n in this debug n, right, run, we get negative four to three. So we should be able to pass in our own range here. So instead of zero to y, let's do y bound, x bound. I'm going to ask for a range of i32s here. And x bound is going to be a range of i32s here. We need to bring that type in. I guess we can just pass these ranges in. They don't need to be shared references. And then that problem goes away. And then we do, what is it? Y bound is a range. So Y min dot dot Y max. I think this needs to be range inclusive because max is gonna be the real number that we hit. So X min dot dot equals X max. And then this needs to be a shared reference. And what is what is the issue with print grid here? Oh, arguments are incorrect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Range inclusive is what I'll use today. And I'm using very specific types here, but we just talked about this in the sense that, um, you know, this map is just a slice and that opens us up a little bit. This range is very specific, but we could have said, hey, something that we can iter over where the iter is uh, an I32. Maybe we'll do that later. Replace this with iterator for each. That's not relevant yet. And I think what I want to do with this is y bound dot Cartesian product x bound. So for y x in this, I think that'll give us everything we need because this should be oh right new lines. <laughs> um, that's annoying. That's why I didn't have it before. Why did I switch back to this? So we'll do this and we'll clone the range instead. We'll run this out. And this does it look like what we're supposed to have here. We've got this like janky backwards looking S thing. It looks like we've got potentially one issue here. So on our turn, or is this upside down? I think this is upside down. Well, we're printing our grids upside down, unfortunately. <laughs> Oof, uh, can we get our print grid to do the other way? Okay, so we reversed it. <laughs> I think everything looks good now. So I just reversed the Y direction for the print grid, even though it doesn't affect our output. So we're looking good here. We now need to fill this in. I do wonder at this point, if we run and we check out the path. Oh, wow. Let's make this enormously tiny. Oh, we can't, can we? We can't make it small enough to look at. Make it tiny. So I think that we don't get for free the ability to do anything for free. I think we have to run the point and polygon algorithm. And I think we just have to touch every pixel effectively. I don't think we get a free ride here. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to shoot array from the left side through the right or something like that. And every time we cross, I think any, I guess we should do diagonally, first of all. 
because it doesn't look like there are any diagonals next to each other. So if we do diagonally, we should be able to go through the entire grid, filling in everything every time we cross a hash. So it's gonna be the point and polygon algorithm that we wrote the other day. At least point and polygon is the way that I wanna solve it. I think flood fill works for today's application. Okay, here's our pipes. And then here was a lot of our grid positioning stuff. And then I think it boiled down to this, just this, right? Go through everything, count the edges, based on which side of the edge we're in, we are either inside or outside. We wanna do it diagonally today because I feel like that's easier in terms of like, let's let's run the test again so I have something smaller to talk about. Because we wanna start, I think, at above the top and start going diagonally through it. I guess we do have crossovers, but crossovers here, like cross, we're in, cross, we're out, cross, we're in, cross, we're out kind of thing. I think we're good in general. So like here, thanks. Tough to look at that when you're not on a, <laughs> so that, I guess this is a situation in which it wouldn't count this edge here, right? Cause out, in, out, in, count in, out, in, that wouldn't match. So I think if we do it diagonally, we run into the same problems we ran into the other day, actually. I kind of don't want to write a flood fill, even though it looks like it'll work. So our other day was basically count S curves, right? So if we went up, up, that would count as in. Is there a situation in which we don't do that? It would be this one on top, but they all seem to do that. So I guess the answer is we test to see if this is a corner, right? If we ever hit an actual corner and the corner is fully on one side or the other of the diagonal, then we ignore it. And I think that's our only condition. I also feel like we're gonna have to color these in, which feels very, very much like we're gonna have to go in from every direction. So let's write in from the left-hand side, because I think that's easier to debug anyway. Um, actually, now that I think about it, do IVEC2s probably don't have partial leak on them, right? They do have partial leak. <laughs> Glam isn't in Rust Playground, so this is compiling at least. So let's throw a bin in here. Uh, call this Glam Debug FN Main. Let me run hello, and then we do this cargo run bin Glam Debug. That runs hello. So if we've got our position, right? And we've got, let's see, negative one, one, zero, zero, one, and zero, negative one. For, I'm gonna call it Y, Y is weird. For Y in this, we do need to bring in Glam's IVEC2. I think, what so what I'm thinking right now is that we can do a comparison of uh, X and Y. Oh, they don't have ORD, that's why. For a second there, I thought we were gonna get really lucky, uh, but I thought in my head that partially meant ORD and it doesn't, so we don't have that. Uh, so this is as good as useless, which is fine. And then we just go here and we do, so if we start from the left and we go, I guess this is just y, win, y min to y max then. We don't need anything special here. So we're going from top to bottom and that's our row. Then we get our I32 for the row here. And then we do X min minus one dot dot X max, I guess dot fold here. And so I'm thinking about this in a way that is basically, I feel like we're gonna need all of the tiles that are interior. So I wanna keep them around for part two. We do need to keep the number of crossings around, right? So we've had zero crossings when we start. So crossings and last edge, I guess last crossing is the thing that I want, which is gonna be none with the next position. And we do, we do need something that isn't a VEC of these IVEC twos, but we don't, do we? Contains is fine. We can do that later. It's about crossings, last crossing, and all interior <laughs> tiles, which is just gonna be a VEC. So if travel contains next position, this is either true or false. And this needs to be an IVEC to where X is the next position and Y is the row. None doesn't have a type up here, that'll be fine. So if the next thing we're gonna hit is a wall, the simple version of this is whenever we hit something, crossings plus equals one, this needs to be mutable, of course as does this. We always return the accumulator, which I've kind of deconstructed here. So if travel contains the next position, then our crossings go up. Is this still an issue? This can neither be inside or outside, so we don't care. If it's not a crossing and crossings mod two equals zero, I think that's outside, right? Else inside. So for outside, do nothing. Inside, all interior tiles dot push the IVEC two, that is next position in a row. So we keep all the tiles around and then this isn't doing anything right now and that's fine. We'll call it a none of an I32 or something. We do nothing with all of this. So let's do let result equals that. And what this will eventually give us 
is going to be all of the um, interior tiles. So if we take the travel, interior tiles is gonna be that iterator uh, of the rows with the folds, which means we get an I32, an option I32, and a VEC I32 at the end here. Is that true for everything? That doesn't feel right. So we do this fold, right? This fold ends here. That value gets returned. And we're doing that for every row. So if we're mapping here, we're getting each row here. So I guess we're flat mapping here. And then we're doing x.2.collect. And we don't have a type here. So let's name this a vec of ivec2s, which I think works. And then travel.iter.chain interior tiles.iter.collect gives us the full grid, right? This is references to ivec2s. So we get a grid, which is a grec of I blah, 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 blah. We get a grid, which is the ivec2s. Did I get rid of this print grid already? No, there it is. Let's copy this and we will print the entire thing, which is gonna be grid here. So at that point, this is what we get, which is going, I'm expecting this to be wrong, just to be clear. This is what we have, which doesn't work as you can see in the middle there. And this is what we need. So we're really just failing on this centerpiece right here, which makes total sense because, is it these two? This segment needs to turn into an interior because we're crossing over. And how do we do that is the question. And I think the answer is, if the Y of the wall when we enter is different than the Y when we end, then we are crossing. And if not, then we aren't. So how do we determine that is a question, right? So when we cross, I think we store the last crossing. So if we cross crossings plus one, last crossing equals this IVAC. We should build this IVAC once. We're building it like three times. So at next IVAC equals this, next IVAC. And then come down here, replace this with next IVAC. And then last crossing needs to be next IVAC <laughs> because this needs to be an IVAC too. And this needs to be sum. And last crossing needs to be mutable. So we should have a last crossing now. And I guess we only keep this. No, we keep it no matter what. We do both of these things. And then if we're on an empty space, right? An interior empty, empty space or any empty space actually. If last crossing, if sum last crossed equals last crossing. I guess we could do this, right? If last crossing dot is sum and then do something. So if this, the next IVEC minus cross equals, what is it? IVEC to negative one zero. If it's the very last one that we just cross, then last crossing is none, right? So if we cross over a line and then we exit and we have, and we don't see a connection, like we aren't on uh, another hash, then last crossing is empty. It resets for the next time we cross. Otherwise, we do end up up here over and over. Kind of wish I could skip to the end one easier. Well, if we hit an empty space, right? And then we, and the first space we crossed is right next to it to the left, then we reset. So if we land on an empty square and the last crossing is directly before the empty space, then reset the last crossing. If we land on an empty square and the last crossing is further, so else last crossing is sum, let's put this inside here. Let's put this inside there. If we land on an empty square and the last crossing is not directly before the empty space, then calculate if we should cross. So I think these crossings logic comes later, right? Because we're deciding if we should cross here. So this is definitely true, right? If we are in an empty space and we were just in an empty space, which means that last crossing is none, then we have to do this calculation and we're done. If we're in an empty space and our last crossing was far away, that means we just went through a chain of a horizontal and we have to figure out if that is something worth crossing or not, which means that up here, it's only last crossing. If last crossing is none, then we set it. Otherwise we leave it alone because it just needs to be there while we uh, go over and over. So if the last crossing is some, then we are still calculating crossings, right? And I guess we shouldn't increase yet. We set the last crossing if we cross over and we increment by one, Otherwise we're not counting it yet, which means that if we land on the middle condition down here, if last crossing is sum, if we land on the empty square and the last crossing is not directly before the empty space, then we have to go to last hash equals what next IVAC or where are we currently? Next position, next IVAC, next IVAC. I guess that's not really next IVAC, is it? It's current IVAC. So last hash is gonna be one to the left on the X value. So we get an IVAC two for the last position and then we need to determine whether the line crosses over or not. 
looking at the input, I didn't see any that were directly next to each other. So I'm gonna assume that if it has one next to it, it is. So we need to do two things here. We need to check each position for contains. So what is that? Travel contains? It's basically this, travel contains. So we get last hash up and last hash down is we can do y and neg y. And this can be neg x. Getting a little bit, little bit pushed out from the edge here. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got last hash up, last hash down, and we need to do the same thing here. So here we should have a last crossing always. If we don't, then we're doing something very wrong. So last hash is gonna be last cross. We're gonna do the same thing, and we need to test for four of these. So we can do each of these right below their respective segments. So we've got last hash contains up and last hash contains down. Same thing exactly we're gonna do down here. That's a really kind of a messy way to do this. Oh well. It happens. Copy this. This is last hash. We're going to replace last cross. So the answer then becomes if this and this or both down. I guess we only need to do these checks, don't we? We don't need to actually do the other checks. So if they're both up or they're both down, then we stay on the same side, which I think if we're on the outside when we start, then we're going to just bump crossing by one. Is that not what I call it? Crossings. Right, then we cr bump crossings by one because we plus one to get into this in the first place. Otherwise we leave it. But if we're bumping by one, that brings us back. So if we don't bump by one, then we're crossing and the current one needs to get pushed. And if we test that, we get this horrible, horrible, horrible output that doesn't make any sense. So did I miss a push? I clearly did. Are we at least doing the right thing for a subset? Did we reset to none? We need to reset one of those to none, right? If we're staying on the same side, we haven't already reset this to none, so we do need to reset to none. I think we also need to do the test here, and then we also set to none here. I think we just set to none both ways. So if we run that, then some of these work and some of these don't in different ways, but they're all interior, right? I think this bottom one is the valid one, right? So all of that really works. It is outside if it's even. I always forget which one of those it is. Outside if it's even. So if it's U-shaped, like we've determined, then we stay on the same side because we've already we've already plus one for the initial, right? We've already plus one for if last crossing is none, which it should be to start with, crossings plus one, last crossing equals this, then we hit a negative, so it shouldn't contain. Because it doesn't contain, it will be sum, and it will be the next one. Last crossing equals none. Oh, this needs to get added though, okay? So for example, right here, we cross over, this becomes some, we hit here, becomes none, and because we are crossings one, this should get pushed. Otherwise, we'll be something like here, I guess. We can't, we shouldn't be there. This shouldn't happen. This should fill in. Let's do some info, info logging here, because this is a lot of logic. More logic than I thought it was gonna be, honestly. So let's do tracing info. Let's do test log down here. Let's run with rust log info. And we see our output here. I do wanna keep skipping some of that input, right? So we skip input here. And we'll just throw this on the parsers as well for kicks, because if we're instrumenting stuff, we are instrumenting stuff in general. So this is all the next position stuff. We should make that an IVAC, I think. Day 11 was the last day that I did tracing stuff on. I remember that. <laughs> so I'm going to grab this and copy it over. This of course will need to be closed. We aren't setting up the right stuff here because this is this is old stuff, right? So let's pull this in and we'll call this row span. A lot of this can just get taken out. And then we're running the span. So for this span, we probably want crossings, last crossing. We don't need all interior tiles because that's just a collection of everything. And I want the next IVAC here too. So let's pull this out and stick it up here. I think this is gonna be debug info stuff. Yep, value is not implemented for IVAC2. That's gonna be this one and this one. And now when we run this, we get a whole bunch more information. Next position is not necessarily what I want to deal with right now. So let's do infos in here, right? Contains is none. Wait a second. Shouldn't crossings plus equals one ha be happening anyway? Wait a second. If it's none, then we increase crossings. Otherwise we don't. And crossings should only be none when we exit a crossover. So I think that's actually right. And then for false, contains false. And 
We're gonna is sum and, and we'll is sum. This is gonna be a lot of output, but it's gonna be fine. What is this else for? Is none. We already have an it contains is none. And this is last crossing is none. Okay, so let's start with that. This will be a lot of log output. I'm, I'm not gonna pretend it's not. Let's filter by row maybe. Negative nine is not what I wanna start with. Let's do something a little bit more recent. I guess this is gonna be right at the bottom here, so it doesn't really matter. Zero, zero is not, zero, zero is fundamentally uninteresting because it shouldn't add anything ever. It is logging multiple crossings though, isn't it? No, it doesn't, okay. So zero, zero, negative one, zero, negative one, zero, five, negative one. Is there an easy way to print out which row we're working with at least? Probably not. Let's include row here. And we get row zero, row negative one, negative two, negative three, negative five. Interesting. I guess I just don't, I don't know which tile is zero, zero anyway in that grid. So this should be low. It should be the bottom row. It should be this bottom. So we've got our spam. We've got our IVEC two. Our original grid looks like this. We work out well for, I guess if this is zero, negative one, negative two. So let's do negative one. I'm gonna drop a dot mvrc into this directory and I'm gonna fill it with row span. Row is negative one info. And we are gonna dive into that directory. I'm gonna use durenv to allow that because I use the durenv tool for this. We're gonna get rid of the Rust log on the front and we're gonna run this. And the only logs we're gonna see are for that row, which are still fairly verbose. So let's take a look at what's going on. So here, should be here, right? Right at the right on this row. We should hit something immediately. So negative one, negative one is right outside here to the left. I think that's how we set that up. Contains false, makes total sense. This is registering two crossings total, but it's registering a crossing at zero, negative one. Yep. Next, IVAC is one, negative one. Yep. That is negative one. And we're increasing crossing count. We've already increased the crossing count if we are escaping like that. So this is the is sum. That's this. Why is that this? Shouldn't that be this? Is sum and negative one, right? Contains false. Absolutely true. Z like one negative one doesn't exist. The row is negative one. We hit is sum. Why do we hit is sum? Because is sum and given this cross, given the next IVEC, which is one negative one minus the cross, which is zero negative one. One minus zero should be one. Oh, am I testing for the wrong thing? Should this be one? Ta-da, mostly done. Thank you, debugging. We still miss on this row. What is this row? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. We miss on five. So let's check out five, that is negative five. Save that. I have to run Durev and allow then. And if we run, we see all of our negative fives. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. I feel like there's, I should have expected more logs. But let's see, zero, one, two, three, four, five. Five. So this is this dot in the middle that we missed, right? Because now we're working with this, which is so close. So that dot in the middle is after a chain of three, right? Right, after a chain of three. So we should get, how many crossings do we have? Two crossings. This should be one crossing, and then this should be another crossing. So that sounds right to me. Are we not pushing in this one? Let's see, Where? when do we get to there? We get to that on zero, one, two, three. So X three, which is this one. And we get into is sum on that one. Should we be in is sum on that one? I think so. Actually, no, we should be here, right? Because it's is sum and we're the next one. So we've got three negative five, three minus zero is three. Oh no, okay, so that's what that's why we're here. Three and zero, that makes total sense. So we're at is sum and ideally, in this case, we find a down for the first one and an up for the second one. So if that's the case, then we should hit here. But let's do an info on all of these to check the values. So let's run this again. And we should get, let's see, hash up false, cross up false, hash down true, cross down true. That's wrong. So we must be doing the wrong math here. What should we be getting? We should be getting cross down last hash, right? Or last cross, which <laughs> I named these horribly. Oh no. Next IVAC. Okay, so last hash is the one before and last cross is the first one. So hash should be up and cross should be down. Which one is true here? Hash should be up, cross should be down. So cross down is true, hash down is, should be false. So last hash down and last cross down are the same and the logic looks similar, which makes me 
think that we're calculating the next IVAC wrong. So let's info last hash and three negative five, three negative five, last hash is four negative five. If we're dealing with three negative five, that shouldn't be it, right? Oh, cause this needs to be a plus if it's gonna be negative X. All right, two little bugs that we fixed with tracing, I think. So what, two dots, two dots, four dots, two dots, two dots, four dots, that is correct. Man, tracing is so good. Tracing, I, I love tracing. It is like console log debugging, but brought to just absolutely the next level. And the best part about it, all of that works in production. <laughs> so we don't need to print the grid right now. What we need is the grid count, right? So, okay, grid, this is a vec, so we just do that length. Is that right? And if we test, we get 62 and we didn't fill out the correct number. What is it supposed to be? It's supposed to be 62, so we are passing. I'm gonna throw a allow dead code on the print grid so it stops giving us a clippy warning because we aren't using it, which, you know, sometimes we won't be using it. Okay, so the test works. If we run, I didn't get rid of the infos, unfortunately. That's not the right answer, it's too low. Return to day 18. That's unfortunate. That's really unfortunate. 40,991. That's really unfortunate. I guess let's dump the map into a file. So instead of print grid, let's do write grid. We'll take the same stuff for Y and Y bound reverse, for X and X bound clone. I guess we'll change these to write. I don't remember exactly how write works in terms of using standard out. I think we can just do this to a file. Oh, the example they give us just writes to a string. So I think I'm okay with that for the moment. Mutable reference to the string. We do need to bring in the trait standard format right for the right macro to work. Every right macro returns a result, which we are going to throw away in all cases, I believe. We should, we'll just expect them, um, honestly. We're gonna snag file in here from standard FS file. We're gonna do grid.txt. We do need standard IO right here. Each of these is gonna be an unwrap. Is it not? coming in oh so we have format we have an issue here we have format right and io right so if we format right and we use as underscore for each of these traits that allows us to use multiple traits with the same uh names in the same file so here we aren't using this yet because we still want to expect here before we run this we'll unwrap and then write grid is going to replace print grid run our test we'll get a grid.txt that says hello world as expected. So now we need to take our string. We use as bytes on it to get the bytes and to write them to the file. And then we look at grid.txt and we have our grid. So if we run our part one, then we get everything here, which looks like we're missing one right there. I see a couple like that actually. Those are the ones that we're missing for sure. So is this a case where I've messed up again? Can we... Hmm, let's do the same thing. And let's take a right grid of not grid, but travel. And we can try to find these locations. Let me not do right grid here. Since we already have that grid, let's rename this grid filled bug. And then we run this. And now what we have is the grid on the left and the filled grid on the right. So we need to now find the location at which one of these bugs exists, which I think here, line 54, right after this chain. Is that a similar case for all the other ones is my question. 92, right after that chain. So my thought process here is that we just fixed an incorrect addition of a negative X here. It looks like we're adding Y correctly. So it always seems to be after a corner. And I guess we could run this, right? 92 is doable. Let's get one that's a little bit closer maybe. Let's get this one, 78. So that'll be negative 77 in our log. So let's go into mvarc and do negative 77. And I don't wanna overwrite this while I'm looking at it. So I'm gonna take the, the right grid out for the moment. And then I'm gonna run this and hopefully it'll dump me all the info logs. Oh, nope. Let's do a dir env allow to make sure that that environment variable is in. And now we're at 77, right? And we need to be way sooner unfortunately. Maybe we try to find one at the end instead, just because of how the output looks. So can we then get this one? Negative 65 would be the, the number for that. So we run that. 
negative 65. Let's see how many characters we have here. I need a VS code editor in thing for a character count of the selection. This is 287 characters. So that should be this one, 287, 292, 287, right here. So right after 287, we should see crossings. Well, crossings four is the right number, I guess. And that doesn't change. So are we not pushing something that we should be pushing is my thought. Let's see, 287, right, contains false. So we're looking at false. We've just left a horizontal chain, correct? Negative 65, which is this row. So here we've just left a chain and it's a U-shaped chain. So this should be inside, which makes me feel like we're all, after U-shaped chains, we aren't pushing. So crossings goes up after a U-shaped chain, but in fact, we are not pushing and we do need to still do this check. So no matter what happens here, this needs to happen. And if we do that, all the debug logs for that row will still split 41019. 41, that's bigger. I think that was our bug. That is a gold star. Hooray for tracing. Tracing made that debugging process so much more manageable than it otherwise would have been. So we're into part two. The elves were right to be concerned. The planned lagoon would be much too small. After a few minutes, someone realizes what happened. Someone swapped the color and instruction parameters when producing the dig plan. They don't have the time to fix the bug. One of them asks if you can extract the correct instructions for the hex codes. So each code is six hex digits long. The first five encode the distance in meters as a five digit hex number. The last encodes the direction to dig. Zero means R, one means D, two means L, and three means U. So we'll just translate these to our direction. And then we have to use the hex code to get some number, 461,000. That sounds like a job for the GPU, honestly. Uh, but it sounds like that's gonna take a while. I hope that this is not so big that we can't handle it. I32 max is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten digits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten digits. We have to at least, if we're going to try to brute force it again, use an I64, at least. This number to me seems big enough that this is going to be a problem if we try to brute force it. But I am going to start with that because we do need to parse these anyway. So we don't need the hashes, but we do need the first five hex. So let me go into nvrc. Let's comment this out for the minute because we don't need to see our debugs right now. And then we've got grid and grid filled bug. I don't think we're gonna be able to write out something that is as big as the other thing into a file like this and still be able to see it. So let's start with doing the hexadecimal stuff. And then I do believe that that is going to be too much. And we're gonna have to come up with like a solution for the area. I thought we were gonna have to deal with these numbers in like a much different way. So I kind of wish <laughs> that it had given us some hint as to not needing all of the pixels inside. So we do need these still. I think I'll just leave that parser. Are we in part, let's do part two. Make sure that we're making these edits in part two. Close part one so I don't mess things up for us. So these still need to parse. They don't necessarily need to be these things, but they need to parse. So I think I'll just leave it. We need five characters and we need these to be our new. And actually, do we even need anything here? So we don't even need anything up until the hex. So we go hex, we take five, and then we get the sixth. And then everything else doesn't matter. I am going to comment this out because it's very similar to what we're going to write in a second. This is no longer necessary. And then we're gonna do like what, take until hash. And this whole thing is terminated in a hash. So that should take off everything that we don't care about. And then delimited doesn't take this anymore. I don't even know that we need to check this. We're just gonna actually, I happened upon the, the demo again for Nam while I was going to the docs and uh, I was confronted with U8 from string radix. So that is what we're gonna use in here somewhere. But I believe this is literally gonna be take five input and take one input. I don't use take very often, so this might be slightly off. And that gives us string slices for both of these. And both of these are gonna need, what, I64 here? From string radix 16. And this is not gonna be input, this is gonna be hex. And this is count and let direction equals match. Uh, this needs to work, so should parse. Don't care, that'll always work. Match here, not on hex, but direction. There's something wrong there for some reason. 
and I can't see it. So we're gonna run this. Test part two, expected I-32 found I-64. Yes, because this is going to have to be I-64s and this is gonna be anywhere we have I-Vec2s, which is like everywhere. I think this is I-64 Vec2, yada, yada. We can fix those types later. These need to be U sizes, yada, yada, yada. I guess we can fix the type issues. Do we have an I-32 anywhere in here anymore? Yeah, these. I-64, done, congrats. And then this is the problem. Not exhaust, oh, it's just the pattern match. So zero is what? Right, so that's zero. One means D, two means L, and three means U. Okay, and then there's still an issue because if it's anything else, which it totally could be according to the parsing logic, unreachable, advent of code, yay. Um, now I think what this means for us is that we don't actually need the color ever. So we can just get rid of that entirely. Um, I am a little concerned that our test is running for that long. So I think just from our test running for that long, we can't actually do what uh, we were having. I guess this is the cubic meters from our test, right? So I walked away for a second and came back. Our test is still running. I think that means that brute force just not going to work. So the question then is what will work and what do we need to actually do is since we only need the area, we don't actually need any of the values. We probably didn't need to implement point and polygon and we could have in implemented an uh, area purely because of the way the grid looks. That's not our grid. This is our grid. So I think that if we draw a line that is equivalent to all of these positions, right? So effectively, this is a lot of boxes put together. So theoretically, we do have a way to get the area of a ton of boxes put together. One box is straightforward is the way that I'll say, because if we have, if we only consider this box, right? Then all we need to figure out the area here is length and width times two. So if we have the vertices, let's say, we basically need this, I think. So theoretically, assuming we move, let's say top down, we have all the vertices. I feel like this is really awkward and there's gotta be a better way. But basically the idea here is like, if we cut this off here, right? Or I guess if we take any four, right? So we take the area of like a, a four sided whatever, we take four points, all the points have to be inside or like to fill, they have to be inside. So it can't be like this point and this point, but it can be these two, this one and this one. And then the next one would have to use those two. So it has to use this one and this one, but it could be like here and here or something like that. The other thing we could do is try to find like the area of this box. So from the perimeter width, width could equal perimeter over two minus length. I feel like that still requires us to know too much. So given the vertices in order, either clockwise or counterclockwise, which we can do, <laughs> enter into the calculator and <laughs> hit calculate. That's not what I want to do. We don't have crossed over. So we are looking at the simple way here. Okay. X1, Y2 minus Y1, X2 plus X2, which we used here, Y3 minus Y2, X3. So I think we're just going around using these coordinates. So is that X1, Y2 minus Y1, X2, and then X2, y3 minus y2 x3. Okay, so this is our equation then, this over two. So let's start there. So then when we're doing this, right, and we're doing the, our flat map here, we really only need to keep track of the vertices. If we need the perimeter length, I think from the vertices we can calculate that. Because if we're at zero, zero, and we go to six, zero, that is six. So it's the first one minus the second one. I guess it's the absolute value of that. And we're always vertical or horizontal, so we don't need to worry about anything else. I guess we can use ivec2.distance or something like that. So does our scan still work? Does our scan even matter, right? Because like, we don't need to flat map this anymore because we don't need to repeat the instructions because we already have the counts and we need to use those counts specifically because otherwise we're not gonna go fast enough. So if we start at zero, zero, right? And we do state and next. Next is our dig instruction, our new dig instruction and our state is our IVEC2, then we've got the direction that we need to go in and we need next.count, right? So state plus equals that gives us the next vertice over and over and over and over. 
So if we collect that, we end up with all of the vertices. I don't think we need the min maxes, and I don't think we need any of this interior logic anymore. We can always go back and get it. It's in part one, right? We don't need to write this grid out because what is there to write out anymore? We don't need to iterate. We need to scan here. We need to get all the vertices. I think we have them here. So we need to fold over the vertices, I suppose, right? Let's let's collect this and let's call this vertices. So vertices.iter dot tuple windows, right? A, B, and we need, for the perimeter, we need the distance. For the area, we need this calculation that we looked at. So X, one, Y, two, let's call, them, let's actually call these X and Y. So X, one, Y, two, man, that doesn't translate well at all. <laughs> y, one, let's do this. I'm gonna call these one and two. And we're gonna do X, one times Y, two, and it's plus, right? Plus Y, one, X, two, Y, one, x2 and we have to do all of that over and over and over and then sum them up into an ivec 64 that i hope that is implemented for i've never tried to sum ivec 2s like this so tuple windows and this is dot map and i guess this is a tuple so that we can drop that back and then this gives us an i64 which i don't know if that's the correct number we'll have to check area equals this over two so if we comment this out for a second and we to do, this should be not the number we need per se, but it should be a big number. Area equals zero. X1, Y2, X1, Y2, minus, 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 minus. We still get zero here. Why is the area zero? Does this only hold if we push everything into the positive quadrant? The vertical bars mean you should make the result positive even if it calculates as a negative. That's for the whole thing. That's area zero. Is it not even doing anything? Are there no vertices? Did I mess up that bad? <laughs> yeah, there's one vertice here. I messed up the parser because I, I didn't test the parser, almost certainly. So digs, ivec210461937. We didn't even check that. 461937 and then 56407. But that's not coming through because I did what? What did I do wrong? Take, take, parse, dig instruction, line ending, separated list. I guess we could many one dig instruction because it's take until that works. So let's keep that. Let's not debug vertices. Let's not debug this because that'll give us just a list that we can go check. 56407, 56407, 500 and 254, 500, 254. So we're getting everything now. Let's get that debug out of here and then collect area sum dot abs. I guess this is dot abs on the whole thing technically. So the area should then be this number, which is a big number that is kind of similar to what we were looking for, but not what we're looking for because I think, yeah. So yada, yada, yada. And then th this is the perimeter value basically. So how do we get the perimeter length? We need to do this again, right? So perimeter length is the vertices iter, I guess tuple windows. Tuple windows is going to be the distance between one and two, which I guess for vertical and horizontal is just gonna be two minus one dot abs, right? If we're trying to keep the running tally, IVEC, IVEC minus cannot subtract, can't subtract references, fine. So IVEC minus IVEC is a vertice minus a vertice. If we're at 10, zero, subtract zero, zero, then we're at 10, zero still. And that distance needs to be X plus Y. Because if we're at 10, 10, and we're at 10, 5, then it'll be 5. So it'll be the addition of this. So it's going to be, I think, distance equals this, distance, distance plus y, sum, not over 2, because that would be weird. We don't need to abs it because we already have it. So area plus perimeter length. And our test should hopefully pass. But we are off by quite a bit, quite a bit there. Which one is the wrong one? <laughs> 115 is the correct one. So we are too high. So I think we're doing the area correctly because that gives us most of it. We must be doing the perimeter wrong. I guess it's minus one for each of them, maybe, because they each get used twice. That feels weird. Let's look at our test from earlier, like our test input, right? Where's our test grid? This is our test grid. So this should be, let's assume we're starting here. One, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Let's let's apply this actually to the test input. Let's do this. 
and I need to find out. Uh, we can't do that, can we? So the perimeter length gives us a number that's too high. Without the perimeter length, we end up with a number that's too low. So this is the number we need, this 115 ending massive number. We're close, but we don't have the right answer. I guess the final question for me is, do we need to subtract anything from this? We have the distance between all the points. I feel like that distance accounts for too many vertices, but I can't quite put my finger on what that number needs to be. We've only got 14 vertices and we're above by way more than that. Hmm, I think my final thought here is that maybe I'm not including the very last two vertices, like the last in the beginning, which leaves this too small. So we need to do this over two, right? Let's take this, which is all of the vertices, except for the final two. And then we do vertices.iter.last.unwrap, because there has to be one. One equals this. Let's do this in a block just to, you know, coordinate off from everything else. Let's comment these two things out because we will need them. So this is one, right? And then this is two. And then we need to do the same algorithm. The last area is going to be this little bit more. And then we put area equals these two added together over two dot abs. And the answer we get there is, let's start storing answers here. Wanted this with last area this. And then we just did before, I think this was it with that last area, but that is the same number. Last area has got to be zero. Yeah, last area is zero because anything connected to zero, zero is zero, I guess. Because if we're zero, zero, then both are multiplied, we get zero. So that's not the issue. Let's make sure that all of our uh, digs are correct. So I'm starting to feel like one of these numbers might be off because... I feel like the distance calculation, or not the distance, the area calculation is correct. So 41, well, all the numbers are correct from the parse, at least. And it looks like all the directions are correct as well. So that's good. Vertices, churn out all the vertices. Does this miss any vertices? I don't think so. It does get us back to zero, zero, and the zero, zero to first vertice connection is missing, but that's zero anyway, so it doesn't add to the calculation. Given the vertices, we have to add them all together. X1, Y2, minus Y1, X2. Sum all of that up, we get the area, minus the final segment. But that final segment doesn't matter because it's zero. We take all of that, we divide it by two, and we get the absolute value just in case it's negative, which it shouldn't be. Okay, so we're gonna take part two, we're gonna take the implementation, we're gonna put it into part one, and we're gonna debug on a smaller example. So the idea here then is that we don't need the flat map, right? We need this. So if we go part one vertices, this is just adding to the next direction, but we should be scanning to taking all of the instructions and applying them. Then we get our area, and we do all of this stuff, and we drop it in here, and we get rid of basically everything. We did not need to keep around any of those tiles. Really unfortunate, but so it is. So let's do a test on part one vertices, and we should get a failing test, because if we get a passing test like we just did, I am going to be very confused. Did we get a passing test? No, two filtered out. Okay, the reason is because I need to add this into here and we need to do vertices so that this even shows up as a viable option. This is now vertices. I'm gonna start using these IVEX 64s everywhere instead uh, because that's what I'm doing in the other implementation. And then anything that's an I32 like these comes through as an I64. I'm just gonna upgrade everything because that's what we use in the second implementation. I64 vec2, done. So we should now be able to see the I the vertices here. 64 or 62 and 42. And then the perimeter length is 32. So we are doing something wrong here. So what is the issue? If our perimeter length is 32 on this original map, we know what the original map looks like. As long as I haven't deleted it. This is the original map. So we get rid of all the, ex well, do we want to get rid of all the extra stuff? I think we just want to put this in a different file. Let's take this, we'll put it in this file. So if we do command F and we do hash, this is 38. Our perimeter here is 38. And we are getting a perimeter length of 32. 
So that's not good. And then we get a full number then of 62. So 38 and 62 are our numbers. So let's get debug assert area is 62 minus 38 and perimeter, I guess a debug assert equals is what we'll use, perimeter length, and this is 38, right? So just to get some, some sanity checking in there, and these are running and we are seeing 42 for area when we should be getting 24. Um, that's not supposed to be double area, last area. Last area is zero, always. I think we can get rid of last area. It's just junk logic at this point. So we can get rid of that. Area is this, and then we can just scoop this back into here, get that paren on it, and area is this. So area then is 42 when it should be 24. This doesn't sound like it should be accurate. So what's the problem? 42 when it should be 24. Let's comment that out for a second and see if our perimeter is even right. Our perimeter is not right, but the number of perimeters that we have is what, six? We want vertices.length. That's what we want here. So we have six vertices. We do not, right? Vertices.length is 14 and our perimeter needs to be plus six. So this is just wrong overall overall just wrong so we're getting an area of 42 we're getting a perimeter length of 32 which needs to be six higher six higher doesn't mean anything i don't think we need dot abs here theoretically this could be negative but i don't think it will be for us yeah it is negative 42 does it this doesn't need to be an addition right negative 204 definitely not and these are all in the right order right like i know they said do them in a certain order but that still gives us an area of 42 anyway. So it's the same no matter no matter which side we're subtracting, which is interesting, just as a general comment. <laughs> so given all the vertices, if we tuple windows, we should be able to use this algorithm to get the area. That area then needs to be added to to get to the final, which needs to be 62. What what area is not getting counted here? Is it the corners? That would be the number of vertices we have effectively, number of corners, but that's 14, which would be 56. So we would need what, 10 more to get 62? So one thing that I'm doing incorrectly, you know, when I calculate the perimeter length, I wasn't adding the wraparound from the last vertice to the first. So I've added that. I had this calculation in for the area earlier, but I think that was incorrect, or at least for the area, it doesn't matter. For the perimeter, it does. So I'm just gonna drop a plus here to get the perimeter length. So given all the vertices then, we can get the perimeter length by doing a tuple windows over all of the vertices, but we also have to add in the last segment. So we have to get the last vertice and the first vertice and get the distance between those two as well. It's getting a little late, so I did that probably in not the best way. I just grabbed the last one, grabbed the first one and did the addition. I feel like there's a better way to do that but I'm not gonna think of it right now. Then our area calculation, which is overall correct with this algorithm, needs the perimeter length to be added before we do the division. If we do that and add plus one to the end, then we end up with a calculation where if we add our perimeter length that we've calculated and we add the area that we've calculated, that is the correct number. So I'm gonna take this logic that I just put into the part one, and I'm gonna drop it into part two, right where I had it in part one, we're going to run our test and the test is running, hopefully passing test looks like it's passing. We'll run part two. We'll get a number. We'll get into day 18 again, part two submit. And we got the gold star sick. So overall, this is the right algorithm to use for the area. I am not entirely sure why we add the perimeter length and then divide by two and add one. Well, the division by two is, is part of the area algorithm, but I'm not sure why we need to add the perimeter length here. And I'm not sure why we need to add one on the end. So I think I'm going to skip the deep dive for the part one, part one, because that was most of the video and we'll cover just the answer that is sort of the right one, right? Which works for both part one and part two. So we've got these instructions and in part one, the instructions direction is either R D L or U. And the distance we need to go is this number. For part two, that information comes from the hex. So our parser for part one then gets all of the characters and then gets all the numbers and then kind of skips over the rest of it. We keep everything around. So we have a direction, the count and the color, but the only two things we use are the direction and the count. The directions we convert immediately into an IVEC2. In this case, we use X, neg X, Y, and neg Y, which are plus one and negative one 
in every direction with a zero in the non-important axes. So x would be one zero and neg x would be negative one zero. I really liked this conversion to IVEX early because that made the math work out much more easily. So that parser gives us all of the instructions we need to deal with. We scan over that list of instructions starting at zero, zero. And for each iteration, add the next direction times the count. So we add the next vertice effectively, or we get to the next vertice. And then we produce that as the next value. We can collect all of those to get all of the vertices together. So what we're doing here is we're taking the direction, which is an IVAC2, and we're multiplying it by how many times we need to go in that direction. We add that vector effectively to the state, and we end up at the next vertice. Given all of the vertices, we can do a calculation using tuple windows on all of them for both the perimeter and the area. For the perimeter, we need to do the distance. So it's the distance from one point to another is one point minus the other, absolute value, and then you add the x and the y. In this case, one of the x or the y is always going to be zero just because of how the whole grid works out. Because if you have a point at 10, 10, you have to be at a similar point on one of the axes, whether it's the x or the y. So one of those is going to go to zero. Sum all of that and then add the final loop. So tuple windows over this vertice collection will give us the sum for everything except for the last position back to the first, which is important for perimeter. So we also do that. For the area, we use an algorithm that I'm gonna be honest, I don't understand very well. We found this somewhere on the internet and I mostly just started to use it. The tricky parts for me were we needed to add the perimeter length to this area calculation before we've divided by two. That number can come back negative, so we have to absolute value that, and then we can add one to it to get the actual area. And finally, to get the full area, we need to add the inner area plus the perimeter length that we calculated, and that's the answer. This works for part one and for part two in the exact same way with the exact same logic. The only difference for part two is that instead of getting our information from the R's and the numbers, we get our information from the hexes. So the first five characters of this hex are gonna be the number, the count, and the last one is the direction. We can address this in NOM by basically ignoring everything we had before, taking until the hash, as well as taking the hash off, taking the next five characters, or five bytes in this case, and then taking the final byte. The first five, we're gonna parse into a number, the second, number, we're also going to parse into a number. We're going to make both of these I64s because that makes it easy for us. And then in this case, we match on the second number to get those directions back, the same ones we used with the letters. And from there on out, everything is the same. The count came from that first five hexes. We used from string radix on that hex string with a base of 16 to get hexadecimal values. And everything else works out exactly the same. So that's it for today. Today was kind of a long one because I made a couple of mistakes and did part one in a non-optimal way. So I'll catch you in the next one. Have a great rest of your day and I'll see you in day 19.